Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, teaming up with SG1 Sports to provide uh, in-depth college football analysis, discussion, and debate. So we've got the live chats up and running for Ohio State Football Talk with Claire Crawford. You can catch Claire at Buckeye Claire on Twitter. Claire, how are you doing this fine evening? Oh, I'm doing so well. I always love talking football with uh, my friend Mark Rogers. Here I am, and here we are, and Claire and I have a great time talking up the Buckeyes, although we must admit there's not a whole lot going on. So if you're into recruiting, yes, maybe you do have a few things, and I will note right here that uh, in just the last few days, Ohio State has locked up um, Harry Miller. He's the number one guard in the nation, according to 247 Sports and ESPN. He's uh, obviously in the ESPN 300 list and uh, an athlete in, uh, I thought they were all athletes, an athlete in Steel Chambers. He's the number 245 player uh, nationally. He's also out of Georgia. So a couple of guys out of the Peach State uh, making their commitments to Ohio State. When I say locked down, of course, that doesn't come until December. But uh, for right now, they've made their commitment to become Ohio State Buckeyes out of Georgia. So that's a good get for the Buckeyes twice in the past and, week. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting as well, especially with Demetrius Knox and Brandon Bowen both having started at guard, but also one of the two of them needing to most likely move into the middle spot there. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, Miller even kind of sniffs the chance to uh, maybe even threaten for one of those spots. Yes, this is a 2019 class. So Harry Miller, number one guard in the nation, Ohio State commitment. So we'll see if he holds. He's got another several months to, uh, of obviously, we, we know how this works in the recruiting game where these guys uh, look around and keep looking, uh, depending on the person. So I found an interesting nugget here. And uh, full disclosure... I wanted to surprise Claire. I did surprise her before we started uh, the live stream, and she she nailed this. But I wanted you to be able to nail this answer live, but, okay. but you did it uh, and jumped the gun. And uh, I, I can vouch for you, Claire. Okay. So uh, a writer by the name of, got his name listed here, want to give full credit to Chase Goodbread. He's from NFL.com, writing for 247 Sports as well. Chase Goodbread is listing, I guess, a number of categories within college football, setting us up for the fall season, and a number of categories listing his 18 of this and 18 of that. So he has come to list his 18 fastest players in college football. And he used track and field official times and also unofficial times listed by the particular schools on the football field. And there's a few players here that uh, we want to note before we reveal number one. So at number nine, we've got Jalen Rieger. He's a wide receiver from TCU coming off a, a pretty splendid freshman campaign in which he was Big 12 co Freshman Offensive Player of the Year with 576 yards receiving and eight touchdowns. And also another, another TCU player at number seven, Jeff Gladney, a cornerback who ran a 4-3-4 unofficially for TCU. So that's uh, fastest players, according to Mr. Goodbread. Number seven and number nine coming from TCU. Why is that significant? Of course, in week three, the Buckeyes and the uh, Horned Frogs lock up at Cowboys Stadium, but at number one on the list, number one in the nation, fastest straight line down the field, Claire, who's the fastest player in college football? Uh, a guy who uh, that receiver will actually probably see some time against, and that's Kendall Sheffield. He's fastest man in college football right now. He must be. It's right here in front of me. <laughs> Kendall true. Sheffield. So the original Alabama signee, of course, transferring to Ohio State, he holds the official record in the 60-meter at Ohio State. 
and he's the fastest player in college football. So again, very unofficial here, but uh, the measurement was at least based on actual track and field results. So I don't think they were the pads out there the last time I checked uh, out there on the track, but uh, it's a pretty good indication of uh, who can run and who can't. And uh, apparently, well, not apparently, because it's actually on his Twitter feed, feed uh, Claire, is one uh, Paris Campbell took some exception to not being listed in the top 18, and, and Paris thought he was rather disrespected. Well, that's a good place to be as an athlete, in my opinion, is to to be in the hole and to feel like you've been disrespected and to feel like you're an underdog, especially on a team that is so historically dominant. Um, and we've seen Ohio State teams, uh, kind of a uh, king of the hill situation. So in my opinion, Paris, go for it. Use it as fuel. Prove all of us wrong that you indeed deserve to be on that list. I personally would have put him there, but uh, you know, I'm not in charge of such lists. So definitely, Paris, use it for fuel. Prove us all wrong. Take exception be the underdog and and prove with your fellow receivers that uh, you guys definitely belong on that list. So our guy, uh, Ryan Mel, joining the chat online has mentioned, I don't know how accurate this is, but I do know that Ryan uh, joins the chat on a regular basis and is full of football knowledge and hasn't let me down yet. I haven't seen anything insane come out of Ryan. And Ryan is mentioning here that uh, Harry Miller uh, – most likely didn't commit to Georgia because they don't have room for him. Regardless, Ohio State um, gets a commit from the number one guard in the country, according to 247 Sports and ESPN, Harry Miller. Back to the cornerback position, Claire. And I don't know if Denzel Ward was the fastest player in college football, but he was certainly uh, amongst the best cornerbacks in college football. And if anybody in the NFL knows anything, not just the Cleveland Browns, but anyone selecting cornerbacks because he was the number one guy on the board. He was fast enough. We know that. Uh, but uh, Denzel Ward off to the NFL. So he's gone. But other than that, Ohio State in pretty good shape at the cornerback position. So we mentioned uh, the likes of Kendall Sheffield, who actually moved up into the rotation because of Ward sitting out the Cotton Bowl. And Sheffield was uh, in that uh three deep rotation in which basically Ohio state, I can't um, say for sure whether they're going to take this approach coming up this season with Alex Grinch in play. But uh, over the past few seasons, they had taken for their two cornerback spots, the three best players and basically kept two of the three guys on the field and would rotate those guys. So one guy would sit out to get a rest while the other two guys would rotate uh, through the series um, each and every series. So they would basically have three starting cornerbacks and two of those guys would be on the field at one time. So Kendall Sheffield was able to get uh, into the rotation in the Cotton Bowl and played uh, prior to that. He got off to a slow start, but played better down the stretch. Uh, and you've got a host of guys like Sean Wade, a huge recruit who figures uh, to get more playing time this year. Um, obviously a freshman, uh, Jeffrey Okuda, as well, Marcus Williamson, Damon Arnett. Uh, again, a host of cornerbacks in play for the Buckeyes behind Kendall Sheffield. And I think, you know, these are the things that we're going to be just kind of watching out for as Buckeye fans. You had mentioned Alex Grinch and the departure of Kerry Combs. Um, these are guys that we obviously know are very talented athletes. They have some experience, but as far as cornerbacks go as a unit, um, you would like to see maybe a little more experience just to feel more comfortable as like, you know, listing them as one of the strengths of the defense. Um, we don't know what the departure of Kerry Combs is going to do emotionally for this team, um, how cohesive they are going to be as a unit. Um, if I know anything about, you know, Urban Meyer and, and, and how everything likes to uh, kind of run seamlessly uh, when, uh, his assistants end up leaving, which they unfortunately all do. Um, it should be a great transition. And I have full faith if Alex Grinch does indeed step into that, uh, that he will be, you know, seamlessly taking care of that. You know, he's got a lot of 
uh, defensive experience, specifically safety experience. Uh, but I full faith that Alex Grinch can take care of it. And um, I, I definitely believe that Jeffrey Okuda could be the guy that is kind of threatening um, Arnett and Sheffield for, you know, kind of rotating into that of the, of the guys that you mentioned. Arnett had a nice season last year. Unfortunately, the play that comes to mind in bringing up Damon Arnett is the play in the end zone against Penn State in which he had the half interception and the refs had to flip a coin and figure out who had the ball because it was, even after watching the replay, about 18 times difficult to to figure out who came down with the football. And, And I'd love to go back and watch it again because my recollection of the play was that Arnett, um, should have been given the benefit of the doubt, but the offensive player was. Um, so so that's the play that comes to mind, but he had a much better season than that. Actually made a good play on the ball there, and a uh, big touchdown, presumably at the time for Penn State, but of course the Buckeyes were able to overcome that. I believe that play made it 21-3, to I believe, or 28-10, to uh, something in that range, and things did not look good, but... Um, that was JT Barrett's crowning moment, uh, maybe of his career, but certainly the season in uh, throwing the ball like, um, wow, like he hadn't for quite some time in the fourth quarter of that game. So that's the cornerback position. I, I would expect it to be a, a just based on the droves of four and five star prospects and the play of, as you mentioned, Arnett in particular last year, that uh, the Buckeyes will be in good shape. Uh, the, the numbers tell us that if you've got a group of seven or eight that played that high caliber of football on the high school level, that um, three to four of those guys minimum will pan out and be those types of players that uh, they're rated to be at the collegiate levels. Uh, but not a ton of experience there, but um, Arnett and then Sheffield in the latter portion of 2017. Now, where the Buckeyes are a little bit thin, Claire, and if you have anything else to say about the cornerback position, I don't mean to cut you off. Um, Jordan Fuller, he's a guy that we didn't know a whole lot about at this point last year, and Jordan Fuller turned out to be a really good player. And so he's back uh, as the one standby, the one definite the the base the core of the safety position and otherwise ohio state really needs to figure it out they've got amir reap who uh, made some big plays on special teams last year brendan white is in the mix fighting fighting for a spot uh isaiah Pryor uh actually was considered to be the front runner going into spring camp but uh things got a bit muddled at least based on the reports we hear in terms of who's going to stand on the field next to Jordan Fuller in week one. So there's a lot of players there. Yeah. And, and Urban Meyer had mentioned, you know, after the spring game that that was probably his biggest concern um, going, you know, after the spring game is over going into camp um, who exactly would emerge there. And again, there's transition involved with Alex Grinch coming on board and with Kerry Combs leaving and, um, you know, obviously not having someone definite there to dovetail with Jordan Fuller is is going to be a pretty big challenge. And again, we're we're looking at guys that we know have the talent. It's just experience and cohesive cohesiveness in a unit. And you know, you've you've mentioned TCU a couple times. Um, that's a unit that is certainly going to. And one of the things that people who have heard me speak about college football say is Ben don't break and it has been a very much a Shiano type defense to Ben don't break and it's a very fine line uh, with kind of inexperienced corners and inexperienced safeties between bend and break so if 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 they can get that to be a cohesive unit we obviously know that Ohio State has a very very deep talented defensive line um, that that and and linebacker again is something where you know they're replacing three starters there as well so it's going to be kind of a tricky situation with Ohio State um, coming together and really stepping up um, not just as far as talent wise but leadership wise as well Mark Rogers TV the voice of college football talking Buckeyes with uh, Claire Crawford Uh, we always enjoy the discussion with Claire 
even when we seemingly don't have a whole lot to talk about. But we'll get there. We will definitely get there. We are only about, I just heard the number the other day, something like 83 days away from college football. And so it's coming. Uh, you can catch Claire on Twitter. Buckeye Claire, no E. No E. Don't do it. Absolutely not. So I'm going to throw out this question to the masses since you bring up TCU, and I did as well, with roughly, according to Mr. Goodbread, love that name. I can't I say that too, enough. Right? Um, Chase Goodbread, uh, with two of the nine fastest players in college football, and Jalen Rieger, wide receiver, who had a nice season as a freshman last year with eight touchdowns, co-offensive player of the year as a freshman last year in the Big 12, and Jeff Gladney at number seven. He's a cornerback. And in my um, last and the nation's last look at TCU was against Stanford. They went down 21 to three in that game. And it was just a fascinating look at brawler football versus speed football. And TCU eked out like a 39, 37 win, uh, just too fast in space for big, big Stanford. Now, Ohio state, uh, a good example of having the best of both worlds, Stanford size, but uh, TCU speed. So it should be a great matchup in space between Ohio State wide receivers, TCU secondary, and vice versa once we get to week three of the college football season. And, of course, that being the one um, test for the Buckeyes out of conference. So I would like to throw it out to the folks on the chat line, the masses out there, uh, whether they believe TCU has a – of course, they have a shot. They're a very good team, legitimate program that won 10 games last year. So I'm not talking about whether they're going to be throwing throwing haymakers in the dark with a shot. I mean, do you th believe that they are an even matchup for Ohio State like it's a 50-50 game? And if you want to throw us a score or any type of a point spread between not the official Vegas point spread, I can look that up. What you believe that the point spread will be between Ohio State and TCU. Meanwhile, uh, I, I do have some people playing. Um, I believe it's Tony Reale on the um, PTI show on ESPN correcting me here, and I I will take it because I wasn't sure about the uh, Damon Arnett play. And so that was actually, according to Bash Gaming, that was actually Denzel Ward, not Damon Arnett. I thought it was Arnett uh, in the end zone that uh, made it 35-20. And with uh, Bash Gaming's details here, I'm going to take his word for it because he sounds convincing, saying that that, that made the score 35-20 to with 7.30 left in the third quarter. So that's I guess a, I was put in my Jack, place. That's a Jack Park-esque accurate description of what happened during that game. We'll, we'll, we'll have to give it to him. So my apologies, folks. You know when I'm spitting this stuff off the top of my head with 68 Power 5 teams, I sometimes I misfire. Say, you only cover the entirety of college football, no worries. So, so, so sometimes I misfire, and I did on this one. So thanks for picking me up, and, and nobody's uh, slamming me for that one. Yes, it was Denzel Ward, and many people are confirming it over and over. It's Denzel Ward. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you All know, right. I'm chime in on the whole... TCU situation and, sure. and whether, you know, obviously they always have a shot. Anybody has a shot. Um, and my, my favorite reference to anybody has a shot. It will, will always be, and is Appalachian state. But, um, you know, I think that Ohio state is so incredibly talented and deep in the trenches uh, this coming season that uh, if there is a team that's going to um, threaten to have a chance like that, it's going to be that they overtake one of those lines. And it's going to be very, very, very difficult to do so. We've got our guy George on the chat who says 4524, which I will not get this incorrect, was the same score the last time Ohio State faced a Big 12 team on the road at Oklahoma 45-24. So I, I did get that correct. So get me okay. back in good graces with the uh, the throng out there. Yes, uh, so we got George at 45-24. Buckeyes, we've got Ryan with the Buckeyes winning 33-20. to Ryan also throws in that it's a 70-30 Ohio State proposition for a win. I'll buy that. So in, in no way is this a walkover, but Ohio wow. State's clearly a better team but it's not significant. 
is the best way I can describe it. It's a first, you know, it's a road test. And again, we mentioned some of the spots that are not necessarily question marks, but we're not ready to list them as strengths yet. But they're pretty important positions considering they're they're facing some very talented uh, skill players. People are asking about Tate Martell, obviously with Joe Burrow out of the way, Dwayne Haskins in great shape to wrap up the starting job. And and all by all indications, Tate Martell is going to be a a scheme player, a situational player, a package player where they're going to have specific packages that they have built and outlined for Tate Martell's skills, which basically, uh, first and foremost, are inside the 10 yard line as a runner, first and foremost. Now, Ohio State doesn't uh, recruit and sign a player of that caliber rated that high just to say you're going to be Tim Tebow inside the 10 yard line for the rest of your career. He can throw it, he can do some other things, but uh, that's his number one kind of differentiation between he and the other quarterbacks. And that's what I've heard since he stepped on the field in spring is that that's his um his calling card at least early in his ohio state career and urban meyer will probably go to that but also as we discussed claire i think just after the joe burrow defection is that uh, what also has to be considered here is that now tate martell is the backup and uh to risk him out there running around uh uh flying in the face of and the teeth of the defensive front uh time after time may not be something that the Ohio State coaching staff is going to opt to do quite as much as it would have otherwise. I will definitely see Tate Martell with some playing time. Um, I, I know for a fact he'll he'll want to get him on the field. Um, but let's not forget, you know, you and I had this discussion about Dwayne Haskins, but we're now seeing a quarterback. Um, you know, we, we had receivers come back that we thought were gone to the NFL. And uh, I think – I, I would not be surprised if one of those reasons is knowing that there is going to be more down the field play. Um, and then Dwayne Haskins also, you know, Ohio State's offense doesn't necessarily need someone as mobile uh, because they've got two 1,000 yard starters coming back in Mike Weber and J.K. Dobbins and, and, and Demario McCall. Um, it is, it's just a, a stable for, to use a colloquialism. It, it really is um, something that if Dwayne Haskins needs, you know, bailed out, he definitely has office offensive weapons that can do so. And McCall is really a wild card for this season. He could really burst onto the scene and cut loose and should be a more, a larger factor in the offense as kind of that Curtis Samuel player. And when he's been given that chance in mop-up duty, and not that he hasn't touched the football during meaningful time, but most of it's been during uh, the blowout games, he has certainly shown us something. Uh, Claire, I will let you know that as we stand again around 80 days until college football, got our guy George who uh, comments frequently, I mean frequently to Mark Rogers TV, and he's got a way with words, and he, and he can spin a phrase. So he says uh, right now, uh, 70 days left until college football. I'll just keep breathing into this paper bag. Is, is where <laughs> George is on this. Man, I, I feel your pain, buddy. <laughs> so we'll, we'll all get there. <laughs> what gets me through Claire is that summer precedes football season. So that's yeah. what keeps me saying, okay, yeah, I can't wait till football gets here. I'll uh, love it when it gets here, but I'm okay right now. I'm, I'm good. This is a true Ohioan speaking right here. Yes. Knowing that we cannot wish, knowing that we love football above almost everything else and knowing we cannot wish our summer away because it is fleeting and it is beautiful. Claire and I kicked around the Ohio State wide receiver position a few weeks ago because Ryan jumps in to mention that Ohio State has a good crop of wide receivers, according to him, but they're not to the standard we expect from Ohio State. So, Claire, I will direct everyone's attention to an article I read on ESPN.com that I think is still pretty prominent on the college football page, front and center, and basically they're highlighting that this is kind of a different group of wideouts at Ohio State. A number of them had the opportunity to move on to the NFL, and despite some people's disappointment in the production, they had the grades by the NFL scouts and the 
uh, opportunity to move on to the next level, but because they've become such a close knit group and have basically portrayed a lot of characteristics, Claire, that we don't typically associate with a wide receiver position. These guys just root for each other, pull for each other, are right there. They're buddies. It's like an offensive line unit yeah. at Ohio State, but it's the wide receivers. There are six seniors uh, in this unit, and they are ready to finish what they consider to be unfinished business. I think we can fill in the blank there and finish off their careers in style and bring a championship to Ohio State, meaning national championship. Uh, amongst those is uh, one of Dwayne Haskins' roommates, Austin Mack. And, uh, you know, I, I read the same article and, and what I got out of it was similar to what you got out of it is that it feels very much like a unit for once. Zach Smith has to be incredibly pleased. And, and like you said, we're not trying to, you know, bag on wide receivers too much, but they're known for being kind of me, me, me. Um, and it's part of the position and you have to be cocky and you have to be confident and, and kind of blow it off if you make a mistake. But uh, in reality, this is, like you said, a group of guys that, you know, it's it's time for redemption because I think it's been an underappreciated group because of what they've had to go through offensively, through different coordinators and through, um, you know, quarterbacks. We'll just say quarterbacks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and seeing what we saw out of Dwayne Haskins and, and they get to see Dwayne Haskins, you know, every day, um, in the Michigan game, it's exciting as a fan to see the, the fascia of the offense change a little bit, uh, more towards opening it up to highlight some of these wide receivers. And we're watching guys like Michael Thomas move on to the NFL and, and blossom, you know, he was a fantastic receiver. Uh, at Ohio State and and goes down to New Orleans and is everybody's like number one fantasy pick now. He's really showing the world. Um, and it's a great recruiting tool for Urban Meyer to be able to point to and say, hey, this is what we do at Ohio State. But he's kind of a lone star out there right now. It's not necessarily something that you can point to as a, a strength in numbers the last, uh, you know, probably five or six years. So definitely something that they're looking forward to making a big difference and like I mentioned earlier with Paris go right ahead and and feel like you're underrated and feel like you're un they're underestimating you and and feel like you're an underdog because that is a great place to be as an athlete so I mentioned a few minutes ago the TCU speed on offense and defense in the secondary now too bad 28 and and I uh commend too bad 28 and his patience with me because for weeks, Claire, my eyesight was telling me 28 add 28 was what <laughs> I was coming up with there. 28 add 28. I kept calling him 28 add 28. Too bad 28. Gotcha. I will never make that mistake again. Pointing out the TCU speed, great speed, as he calls it, at wide receiver with the aforementioned uh, Rieger at wide receiver, according to our guy, uh, Goodbread, Chase Goodbread, the number nine fastest player in college football and uh, Darius Anderson too, a fine running back Avante Turpin, who's one of the best special teams players in the country, returning punts and kickoffs and just super fast. And, and again, to watch Stanford play TCU and watch those uh, TCU wideouts and running backs operate in space against Stanford and just look the car make the Cardinal look silly. But again, this is going to be Ohio state on the field against TCU and not Stanford all due respect to Stanford, they're not one of the top three or four teams in the country. They're one of the top 15 or 20, and that's where the difference is. It's in the speed game where Stanford's got like three fast guys on the whole team, and Ohio State's got like 35. Uh, there's just a big difference there. So I also caught up with a few other things. So we've got, uh, see, Uncle Lou, I don't know if you've caught this guy uh, on YouTube, Claire. I have not. Have you got to go check out Uncle Lou. So I thought this guy was a raving maniac the first couple of videos I watched, but I, I've seen him since. And, and the guy's just a great college football guy. So I don't know why I'm plugging his channel because he's got like 10 <laughs> times as many subscribers as I do, but I'm going to plug it anyway. But uh, he likes to have fun. So I'm having Uncle Lou on hopefully this weekend. I, I think we've ironed out a time. So right. we should have a great discussion. He's a Georgia guy, okay. but loves talking all of college football. And of course, I'm Mr. Neutral. 
neutral. Oh. I don't push anyone, not a fan, just just uh, deliver just the best, most insightful, most neutral and fair college football yeah. analysis. Big time. Of course. <laughs> But uh, Uncle Lou mentions here that uh, Iowa just scored again. Uh, you know, that, that, that's an old song. Play it, playing the hits, brother. As I outlined to somebody last night, an Auburn fan, albeit, who completely agreed with this line of thinking to take us back to last December. If you're going to discredit Ohio State for 55-24 against Iowa, the, the score that everybody in the world remembers, then if you play that game with losses, you also have to play that game with quality wins, 48-3 to against Michigan State. Nobody else in the country threw up that kind of number against the top 15 team in the country, and Alabama didn't have that kind of win. Then you, you also need to say, okay, Alabama didn't have this, this requires, nor did they have Wisconsin or Penn State on their schedule. This requires logic and reason, <laughs> unfortunately. So if you're lacking in logic and reason when it comes to college football, you've come to the right place here, especially <laughs> when I've got Claire right here to help me out. <laughs> I'm more than happy to rein someone back in with my analysis. So uh, 28, uh, he's correcting me again. I guess it's 28 AD 28. Just, uh, you know, just hang with me here. I'll, I'll get it straight one of these days. He's a Sooner fan. Oh, okay. 28 AD, Adrian Peterson, 28. Oh, He's a Sooners that's fan. That's All that's right. That's Going that's old that's school that's with uh, Adrian Peterson, whose NFL career is just about over. Yeah. Uh, is he? I'm wondering if he's excited to watch his boy play for Cleveland. Oh, I'm sure he is. We're all interested to see how he does. I don't know if I'm excited, but interested, <laughs> all I my am. Interest is peaked. Interested, I am. All right. So Claire Crawford joins me as uh, many times as I can possibly track her down to talk Ohio State football. This is Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, with the best insight, analysis, discussion, and debate on the uh, game we love. So you can also catch my videos over at SG1 Sports. And uh, we're doing some good work with them as well. And I know a lot of you people on the chat and watching uh, make your way over to SD1 Sports. And he does a lot of good things that I certainly couldn't do, like playing Madden NFL games on YouTube. Boy, there are some sick people out there that actually uh, spend 20 and 25 minutes watching somebody else play a Madden hypothetical NFL game for that long. It's a thing. Like all video games, I, I, I've somehow managed to fall into the wrong career. That's what I should have done. Yeah, and get like 25, 30,000 views. Yep, just be a gamer. I've got some suggestions for these people. Exercise, read a book, <laughs> maybe do some landscaping outside. Volunteer work. <laughs> Volunteer work, absolutely. <laughs> that would be... I'm right there with you with the exercise. Oh, yes, you are. You're a few steps ahead of me. <laughs> Just a few. Check out Claire's Twitter feed at Buckeye Claire, and you will see if you keep scrolling down at some point, you will get an idea of what a workout fiend she is. It's yeah. very impressive. Uh, my YouTube as well. That's that's pretty much all it is. If you want, uh, yeah just to be exhausted by watching a video. It's not a gamer video. I'm sorry, Claire. I was unaware for all the times that you've been on here, you have not self-promoted. So I will go over there and subscribe as soon as we're done. Oh, well, thank you. It's shameless <laughs> that I plugged it because it doesn't have anything to do with college football. It's all workout stuff, but it really is fun. It includes um, something that's near and dear to my heart that I think you and I have talked about a lot too, but um, my entire 365 days of uh, push-ups for 22 kills. So we, I, Managed to put in um, over 100 different push-up variations, probably 35 burpee variations. Not that anybody wants to do a burpee, <laughs> uh, but definitely some fun stuff. All right. We'll remind everyone, Mark Rogers TV here on YouTube. It's also Rivalry Month 
here in June. So we uh, hit that uh, platform here a little bit later tonight at 8.30 Eastern time. We got Florida versus Florida State. James Coleman from Gridiron now taking on David Waters from Gators Breakdown. Tomorrow night, we've got Miami against Florida State. That's State of the U with Cam Underwood. And we got James Coleman from Gridiron now. Should be fun. Good luck. I'm and we did the you. game last week. You're gonna be like, um, and, and that was a fun talk as well. It was. My favorite. All right, Claire. Unless you have got anything else to knock out uh, here on this uh, – June week. I don't. Oftentimes, summer is uh, no news is good news. So we'll pontificate and wax poetic until it's time to actually uh, get into the thick of things with with fall. And that's absolutely a fair statement, as Uncle Lou tells us that uh, J T. Barrett uh, questioning maybe his social security status, thinking that he's maybe like sixty five <laughs> now. We <laughs> thought so too, pal. <laughs> I think that for how long he's been with the program, but also watching him for as effective a runner as he is, maybe not the most explosive guy uh, with the ball in his hand. We'll take it. Got the job done though. Yeah, and uh, what he boy to do for Ohio state and, and we'll go down holding a lot of records regardless. Exactly. Regardless of whatever happens to JT Barrett going forward, he can always, he'll have to come up with some kind of slogan or some kind of list or something that shows Drew Brees, number two, JT Barrett, number one. It's going to be a while before anybody can knock that off. Yeah, a lot, a lot of a numbers. A lot of time with injury. I know like people like to talk about JT Barrett. Like, uh, you know, it's a great debate that we've had many times. Uh, but definitely, uh, it's not that he just spent, you know, a bajillion years at Ohio State. He accomplished a lot of great things. And we're grateful. All right. Too bad 28, i.e. 28 bad 28 and all the other variations I screwed up. Uh, we will hit the linebackers at a later date. Yeah. We will get prepared for that. So we'd like to knock out most of the positions as we head toward the first week of August and summer camp. I say, keep your eyeball on Justin Hilliard. Yeah. Very talented kid. No question. All right, Claire. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it as always. Keep so wearing that scarlet red. It looks good on you. <laughs> Thanks. It's, uh, it, it matches my blood. <laughs> All right. Everybody else, come back for a nice uh, Florida, Florida State discussion. I don't know if it's going to get heated. It'll probably just be a whole lot of fun. Florida, Florida State, David Waters, Gators Breakdown, and James Coleman from Gridiron. Now, 8.30 Eastern time right here. We'll be back. Claire, you have yourself a great rest of the week. Thank you, sir.